And here we are live, Doug, ready to rock and roll, my friend. Technology, it's an awesome thing. So, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you uh, listening live right now, thank you so much for stumbling across this program because we haven't advertised it yet. It's a nice slow roll. It's a new thing. We're starting at Checkpoint. My name is Eddie Doyle, and I have Doug Shoemaker on as my second guest for this show, talking to Checkpoint, a behind-the-scenes look at the people that make the magic happen. Now, look. I'm in marketing, but that's a long title. <laughs> no, one, no one, Doug, no one had ever approved that title. But you know what? I'm really trying to get the essence of it in one shot. And that's the sentence I come up with because, you know, we've, we've, we've been around Checkpoint for like 30, almost, almost 30 years now, right? So we've got some big heroes at this company. We've got people that are well known around the world. But I also want to talk to the people that make the magic happen behind the curtain. Like the Wizard of Oz, right? You're 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 the wizard today. That's too funny. <laughs> you're the wizard today. Okay, so if you're watching the archive of this in the future, thank you for watching it. And um, you know, Doug, let's start with this, my friend. Um, let's. So so I was posting about this live stream earlier this morning. So I went quickly went to your LinkedIn profile, and as it is with colleagues that you've let's say known for a decade or more in this case you don't generally go to their LinkedIn page because it's like, oh, I know Doug, right? Yep. And then I saw your work history go down to the, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to bust you here, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> but you've already got a few gray whiskers, so it's not really busting you. It went down to 1980s and I'm like, epic. Now, you know, I'm, I'm very I'm very close behind you, dude. I, uh, I, I graduated university in 93, so that's where my work uh, life starts. So you've just got a, a couple of years on me. But that's really cool. And I started thinking immediately, one of the things I would love to chat with you about since you started in engineering at such an early age, what does the world look like now? Let's do one of those before and after kind of things, right? Sure. So, so why don't we start there? You know, what were you doing in the 1980s as far as your, your first job coming out of the gate? So I, I worked for Digital Equipment Corporation and it was, it was fun. I mean, I got married in 83. My wife and I lived in, in Florida, and when I interviewed for this job, it was up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, with digital, it was 110 degrees difference in temperature when I got on the plane to when I got off the plane. I, I didn't even have a winter coat, but uh, I interviewed, I got the job, we moved up to Minnesota, and I was an installation specialist. And, and my God, I mean, it was, I worked on PDP-11s and, and VAX systems, and these computers are the size of a refrigerator you know, multiple refrigerators, and, and they didn't have near the memory or horsepower that an iPhone has today. It just it is mind-blowing. And were they connected like to other, like not just to each other, but to somewhere else through some kind of Ethernet? Well, ultimately, they were. Initially, no. It was a lot of, uh, you know, scientific applications, a lot of education, uh, some manufacturing. And I, I remember the first, you know, kind of clustering it was uh, it was called an HSC fifty. It's like a hierarchical storage controller, but you're literally running coax cables, and and that's the way they were connected, right? It, it uh, wasn't anything like what we have today. But then, yeah, absolutely, Ethernet token ring took off. Uh, but it's just it, it's amazing to see the difference from you know back then to today. Well, yeah, that's right, because actually it was the U.S. military, it was DARPA, I forget the acronym, you know, but it's the DOD's or it's the Pentagon's Research and Development Branch, right? DARPA, D-A-R-P-A, -A, um, that invented TCP over IP in 1983. So, yeah, definitely the Internet wasn't a thing. There was some kind of connection around. And then it was Tim Berners-Lee and the guys out of CERN in Switzerland in 92, I think it was, that, that, that revamped TCP over IP into a, the World Wide Web. So I imagine at some point, when, when was your first introduction to the World Wide Web? Let's go there. You know, it was probably the um, first time I got email, right? And, and the ability to kind of send email. And it was, you know, just kind of dumb ASCII terminals, you know, monochrome. Uh, and that probably would have been in the 90s, I guess. Uh, but it was very, I mean, no websites. I mean, you could go someplace and it was kind of text-based, some graphics, but very, very primitive. I mean, it was like the Flintstones versus the Jetsons today. Sure. So so you would have been a real early adopter in email. I caught it. So I was still teaching English back in those days. I wasn't even in tech yet. That came in 2002, I got into tech. So, But I still remember, um, because... 
so in education back in those days, you had computer labs, right? So the kids would go from various different classrooms with pen and paper into the computer lab, you know, once, twice, three times a week. And sure. then suddenly the computer lab started really kind of getting interesting. And um, Hotmail was the first introduction to email for me. And so, you know, we were teaching the kids how to sign up and I also did adult education, how to sign up with Hotmail. And then suddenly the computer lab came into every classroom within a few years after that, right? And then now my kids just have Chromebooks. They go to school with Chromebooks, right? You know, although their backpacks are still like fully loaded, these kids. But yeah, so that, and that would have been 99, 2000, around the dot-com boom and bust. Hey, what were you doing at the dot-com boom and bust time? Good night. The dot-com boom and bust. I mean, I think I was working for a company called Network Alchemy. It was a startup out of Santa Cruz, California. Uh, and Nokia ended up acquiring them. Right. That's how you got to Checkpoint, right? Because you were a Nokia Correct. acquisition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what were you doing at Nokia? Okay, so Nokia acquired those guys. What were you doing over at Nokia? Nokia I was a director uh, of engineering. I had uh, North and South America, w which was just awesome. Uh, able to work with colleagues over in APAC and EMEA. Uh, great, great times. And again, amazing technology. And it was kind of fun because we had exposure to the cell phone side of the house as well. So we, you know, I had a closet full of the, the latest and greatest phones while we were, you know, kind of building appliances for checkpoints, you know, software, you know, the firewall one. Uh, and that type of thing. So it was amazing. It was the best of both worlds, right? Able to work with the checkpoint technology uh, and the latest and greatest cell phone technology. Okay, so that's right. Because you say Nokia today, and most people just think cell phones, right? So, so back then, which came first, by the way, the cell phone or the servers at Nokia? Uh, oh, cell phones. Okay, cell so they were making phones. cell phones, and then suddenly somebody had a bright idea at Nokia, which was a Finnish or a Swedish company? Finnish, yeah. Okay. Helsinki, Finland. Finnish company, it's dot-com days, there's oodles of cash around. They're a, they're a phone supplier, so that's that's another oodles of cash kind of company, right? So they decide to get into the server game, right? Is that, is, like, and, and that's what you were doing? Tell us about what you were actually doing with those servers. You mentioned Firewall 1. Go back a bit. I assume people don't know what that is. Well, I mean, basically, I mean, Checkpoint is, is Checkpoint software, right? No. So right. Uh, Nokia built a hardened appliance. And, and we took out all the, you know, unnecessary, you know, print drivers, all the things that you don't need. It was kind of a hardened version of Linux, and it was really, really good at running Checkpoint software. I mean, hands down, I think, you know, the best in the world at the time. And uh, we, we were selling as much of that as we could. Uh, I mean, things like, you know, IPS and antivirus, all those things were coming, but it was disjointed. It was kind of different vendors. And it was fun to watch the consolidation uh, of all that. I mean, sometimes through acquisition, sometimes through, you know, companies just, you know, building the technology. Uh, but it, it was an amazing thing to watch. And, and that's ultimately, I think, uh, why Checkpoint decided to purchase Nokia was because of the, it was the Internet uh, Communications Division building that hard, hardened appliance. Why? I mean, th th there's such a loyal following to the Nokia server base, right? Why is that? Why were they able to build an appliance that just made the magic work with the Checkpoint software versus and, and build a loyalty versus, you know, all the other server manufacturers in the world? That's a good question. I, I don't know. Uh, at some point, it would be good to have like the magic behind that. I mean, I know there were a lot of really good engineers that were able to uh, kind of integrate the software into that hardened appliance. I think that the hardware itself, the, the performance was good, the security was good. I think the people probably made the biggest difference. I mean, it was you know one of the first companies to have, uh, oh man, I, I can't remember what we used to call it now, but basically follow the sun support, right? W wherever you are in the world, you know, we had support centers that would be able to help customers uh, answer you know technical questions and, and fix problems. So I think that was a huge differentiator. So I tell you what, man, that's interesting, isn't it? Because that's still a differentiator today. So as Douglas just mentioned, you know, Checkpoint ended up acquiring the Nokia hardware server division, not the cell phones, right? The, the, the server right. division. Um, with that came the amazing auto attack, right? Correct. That was, that was big. What were, the other, what were the other Nokia attacks that it came with? 
Well, I know we had a Dallas Tech as well. Uh, okay. I know we had one in Japan, and well, I'm sure there was one in Finland. So follow the sun, right? So that that kind exactly. of stuff. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so was Kevin Charles, who still runs our Ottawa Tech, was he the guy in the Nokia days? Kevin Charles was in the Ottawa Tech. I can't remember if he was running it at the time. Uh, but he was certainly an integral part of that and, and still w one of my favorite people up in Canada. And yeah, I, cool, I, I love all super, the other people. So he's a super cool dude. And, um, yeah. you know, we, we've kind of sat across each other from your know, various customer meetings over the years. And I'll have him on this show uh, fairly shortly because that auto attack has become, you know, a, a staple for us. I mean, it's just it's well known around the world and the other attacks as well. But I think Kevin's doing a particularly good job of just, you know, the, the feedback I get is, hey, you guys are actually picking up the phone, right? I get to talk to a human real quick. So that's that's super cool. So, okay, so then Checkpoint acquires that Nokia division and acquires you with it. And you've been how many years with us? And if you include Nokia, it's like, come on, I'm outing so, you again. So in September, uh, it'll be 22 years. Wow, man. So, yeah, that's yeah. crazy. Yeah, 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 that's fantastic. That's really cool. 22 years and well so so the the nokia the nokia piece of the business though was that security like pure security or were you doing other things with those nokia devices uh i'd say it was 90 percent security focused i mean you know we worked with cisco a bit uh you know kind of working with uh um oh the voip technology Right, right. And kind of trying to integrating the, the the cell phones and the VoIP and the and the Cisco VoIP phones into our security appliance, uh, but it was it was ninety nine percent security. Well, so we have, and I I hope I'm pronouncing this name correctly. Um, I'm going to say Diraj. So Diraj, man, just to comment back and say I nailed it or I didn't. Give me a thumbs up or thumb down your name. Thank you so much for joining us. And this is an ask me anything casual conversation with people at checkpoints that make the magic happen. So please jump in and ask more questions. But Diraj is saying Nokia IP series were gold in capital letters. This is what I'm saying. There's still such a loyal following, right? Um, standard hardware and oh yeah, EPSO, that's right. As an yeah. operating system was the magic software, right? I, that's right. That's another reason why I think it works so well with Firewall 1, isn't it? It's because the Ipso OS was brilliant. He's saying, have seen uh, IP series running for eight to ten, eight to nine years. It's amazing, right? Those yeah, IP that was the beauty. Right? You would, they would plug in, customers would run reports, and they would show when the last time the appliance went down, and literally it would be you know eight, nine, ten years. And, and seeing the Ipso, that does remind me, I think Nokia uh, had purchased a company called Ypsilon. And I think that's where that OS came from. Oh, is Ypsilon. that right? Okay, yeah, that's right. I remember Ypsilon. This is all after my day. I joined Checkpoint, Checkpoint in Canada in 2008, right? So, so it was right around the time just after the acquisition got made. So I got to hear about all that, but we were rebranding, so I didn't want to bother learning it, right? I had a new kind of brand to learn. So... Yeah, that's right. So, so you guys had an amazing appliance, and you had this incredible operating system. That was the secret sauce to make the magic happen, right? Yeah. Yeah. And there's, there's a general, so phone boy. A lot of yeah. people have heard of phone boy, Damon Abernethy Welsh. Uh, was just like a majestic resource. Uh, I mean, people would call him uh, for checkpoint issues, you know, while he was at Nokia. And uh, fortunately, he's still here and uh, still absolutely rocks. Yeah. So, so isn't it? I must have Damien on the call. So everybody knows him as Phone Boy. Now he wrote a book um, on Firewall One, didn't he? I think it was. He wrote a book on on basically. I know he wrote a book on Firewall. Yeah, it's on firewall tuning, and I, I've got it here someplace. Right. Signed and where it's at. Yeah. So, so, so Damien and I adore the guy. So I mean this in sincerity. Is like the world's best geek, right? He's yeah, so. Absolutely. Like, He'll remember IP address before he remembers your name kind of guy, right? <laughs> so, so I remember one time I was uh, traveling somewhere and he happened to be on the same circuit with me and he was doing a workshop. I'd just gotten off the stage and it's normally like this, right? Now, you know, I've got my jacket on, there's a little bit of polish and I got off stage and people are like, oh, you know, they want to shake your hand. No, 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 no. They wanted to see Phone Boy and there were two or three people who had an old copy of his book and they were like, Damien, can you, or phone boy, can you sign this for me? Yep. I'm like, Who is this guy? I just met him, right? <laughs> yeah, he's like Elvis. Following. 
Yeah, and just to give a plug for uh, for Phone Boy, he he runs our Checkmates um, division or community, our Checkmates community, which Doug Checkmates, I think, I hope I've got this statistic right, has about one hundred sixty thousand people that are kind of attached to him, his sort of brand and following, and just involved in the community of cybersecurity specific to Checkpoint. But he leads that whole group, as I say, is the world's greatest nerd. <laughs> Yeah, it is a great resource for customers and partners. There's just a, a ton of information, uh, you know, from, from hands-on, you know, just, just very customer-focused, very, uh, uh, the, the word escapes, but basically helpful. Well, it goes back to that question I asked you earlier, and you answered about you know, why was Nokia so brilliant? And in one of the things you mentioned, the people, right? So there's another one, right? You know, there's there's another people, another person that was uh, super helpful. So, okay, so so Checkpoint acquires Nokia. Um, as this uh, gentleman, Diraj, said, you know, yeah, there's some IP series appliances. The IP series, for people who don't know, was the name of the appliance, right, Doug? It was the name Correct. of the appliance in those days, right? Running for eight to nine years. And he's right, I heard, I remember this now. I remember back in Canada, there were people like, yeah, this thing's been running for four or five years. I'm not touching it, it's great. Like, really? You know, and, and still updating the software, though. I mean, it's still working. So magical appliance. So then, um, you know, we rebrand and, you know, we've still got all those beautiful engines and the quality of those products yeah. you know, in the background, just with our, uh, our logo on them, uh, as well as other appliances that we've built. And so now uh, what are you doing? Tell, tell the audience what you're up to these days. Right now, I mean, kind of struggling through all the COVID stuff in Chicago here. Uh, but it, it's actually been really good. I mean, it's been a, a, a lesson learned for anybody, you know, working remotely. Uh, I manage the uh, the engineers, the security engineers here on the Illinois team. Uh, but basically, j just looking for new ways uh, to be able to help people. I mean, obviously, there's the uh, you know the cloud focus the checkpoint has right now, uh, the Harmony Connect, and I think that's really taken off especially with COVID, right? I mean, work isn't a place anymore, right? It, it can be at a soccer game, at a home office. Uh, right now, not a lot of people are going to the office. So it's been kind of fun looking for different ways, uh, not only to be able to you know sell and help customers, but to communicate with them, right? A lot of Zooms. Yeah, exactly. Now, you know, we I, I don't want to do sales plugs on this show, but I've heard Harmony Connect is just... Every time I talk about it, and I talk specifically about Harmony for web browser, people are like, oh, yeah, that's really interesting. Why do you think Harmony Connect, without, you know, we don't want to plug, we don't want to be salesy, like this is a fireside chat with, you know, two, two cyber dudes. But why is Harmony Connect really resonating with people, do you think? I, I think it because it's secure, right? It, it, it prevents things that we don't even know about right now uh, from bringing down your business. And, I, you know, from, from a mobile phone, uh, to a desktop, uh, to a server environment, to data center. It, it, it's just an awesome solution. And it, it's, it's excellent to, to see it demoed, right, to, to really kick the tires on it. But it, it basically uh, kind of thinks of the things that, that we haven't thought of, right? You put it in place and you can safely do whatever you need to do for, from wherever you want to be. Okay, so 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 pretend pretend I'm not a checkpoint guy. I know nothing about this because I think some of the audience members, you're talking to me like I'm a checkpoint dude, right? So so what is it actually doing for me? Harmony Connect, like if I'm a CISO, what what would you say are the real high level kind of things as to? Yeah, you probably should want to pay attention to this one. Well, I, I think if you if, if you look at you know current attacks, whether it's malware or you know phishing. Um, antivirus, like all, all the different threat vectors that can bring down a business, uh, it, it gives you visibility into that one. So it, it prevents that from attacking your company, affecting your brand. But I think one of the biggest you know, differentiators there, especially for C-level, is it, it helps them make good decisions based on having good data, right? I mean, a lot of times you can't see uh, what's going on in your environment. Uh, whether it's cloud or whether it's on-prem. Uh, I think that the Checkpoint solution gives just awesome visibility that allows C-level you know, resources to be able to make good decisions. And I think a lot of times it's really hard to make decisions without good data. 
Can you give me an example of that? And actually, I'm, I'm genuinely asking in this case, so what, what are the examples of data that you would get from Harmony Connect that would allow you to make a better decision? Boy. Like, what are you seeing in the wild, as it were, right? This, this yeah, is what so I think would be helpful for the audience. I, I think this is where um, a lot of times we'll do uh, like an on-site demo or proof of concept, but you could put a device on the network and they can automatically see that, you know, a particular server farm is, is being attacked, you know, constantly, and, and they may not have been aware of it. Uh, you, you can see that, you know, from geographic standpoint that, you know, pick a country, and you know, maybe there's a lot of, uh, you know, DDoS attacks or, uh, you know, malware type activity coming from a particular country, and it makes it really easy to just click on a button and, and block that. And if you didn't have that visibility, you, you would have no way of knowing uh, what you need to prevent. Sounds a little bit like a, a sim in a certain sense. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it does. Uh, but it's I, not, I think, right? It's something no, different it, than that. Yeah. It is not, right. Why? Because of the immediate remediation? Is that why? Well, I, I think that's part of it. I think the checkpoint does a good job providing the great job visibility on our uh, kind of landscape. I think we've got technology partners that we integrate with that kind of shows the, the entire landscape, uh, the more of a sim-like. So we integrate with the big sim providers. That's a, that's actually a good thing, considering we talked a lot about history uh, today. Um, remember the OPSEC stuff? Of right? course. Sure. That was, okay, that was really interesting. Now, I wasn't around for the beginning of OPSEC. You certainly would have been, right? So what was your introduction to OPSEC? And that's another thing, kind of like our tax that we get a lot of praise for, right? We play quite well in the sandpit with other technologies. Um, you know, so so let's go through the history lesson. When did OPSEC kind of start and, and why did it start? And, and, and what do we have today? So first of all, you're way better at remembering dates than I am. Right? <laughs> I, mean, I don't remember my kids' birthdays half the time. But I, I think at the beginning, it was a way to take things that the Checkpoint didn't necessarily focus on but, but saw the, the value add or the benefit, and you could kind of stitch together strategic relationships and, and to be able to provide, you know, sim-like visibility or uh, IPS or, or DDoS or something that we weren't focused on in terms of, you know, kind of growing our own, uh, but we would be able to partner with uh, third-party technology providers to be able to, you know, deliver that solution to a customer. Right. And then now, of course, we deliver, you know, IPS and we deliver, you know, DLP type solutions. And so what would be today's version of OPSEC? Because we still play really well in the sandpit with other vendors. So is there, what are we calling this today? Is, it, is there a name? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, with, with a, like emerging technology is a huge focus and we have a lot of partners. Right. I'm, I'm not sure, honestly, that OPSEC isn't still a name. Uh, I think somebody w will correct me on that uh, if it is, but I know that with emerging technology, and it's especially around cloud, uh, I think there's just a lot of really strong technology partners uh, that kind of provide that, you know, they, they augment the good yeah. things that Checkpoint does. Well, we've got this tool called Google, which I'm looking at right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, you know, so OPSEC, operational security, risk management process strategy that classifies information, determines what is required to protect sensitive systems. Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. So OPSEC is still a thing, but really SIMs are kind of replacing it. Am, am I right in saying that? Right? Yeah, well, I, I don't know that OPSEC was limited to just, you know, kind of SIM type technology. Uh, I would have to look a while back. I had a map that showed the OPSEC partners and the different technologies they focused on. Yeah, because I think what what we were saying with OPSEC in the day, now you remember, because it was before my time, so you tell me if I got this right. What we were saying was, if you are part of this OPSEC list, then we have, generally speaking, tested all of these partners and it'll work for you, right? We're saying we play well in the sandpit. We've tested it out. Of course, there's always kinks. So is that, that that was kind of the OPSEC community, yeah. right? it's kind of like the Apple Store, right? If you download a, an app onto your Apple, you know, right. on your iPhone, right, it's been tested, it's going to integrate. Yes, right. I think it's very similar to that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So we, we still do that, of course, because what would be a good example of how we play? Well, I suppose we play well with the SIM providers, right? 
um, you know, that would be one technology because obviously we provide all that other stuff now, like antivirus, all these things that back in the early days when, you know, Gil was tapping out stateful packet inspection and, and gave birth to the, 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 you know, the network security industry. Um, obviously, we didn't have AV. It wasn't a, it wasn't a, it wasn't a focus for us. Uh, but now, of course, we have that and IPS. These, these things tend to be quite commoditized, um, you know, and it's... Would you agree with this? Okay, so feet on the ground or what you're hearing from the people that you manage. All of those things like IPS, DLP, AV, pretty commoditized. Where, where the conversation is obviously in the cloud, the conversations we mentioned harmony, so remote working, right? The other stuff, do people care as much? I mean, I know they care, but do they really care? Well, I mean, to me, it's, it, it's like a utility, right? I mean, you... You need your electricity, you need your water, you need your, your gas, but you don't want to have to think about it, right? You, you just want it to be there when you want to use it. And I think it, it's like that with a lot of the, the, the security technologies that are commoditized. It's like you just expect it to be there when you need it, right? It's like ragu, right? It's, it, it's in the sauce. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And then, and, but all the innovation is what we're talking about because we're giving birth to those things, right? Like, you know, the latest, greatest technology for cloud or whatever it might be. What, um, what are your teams talking to their customers about for the most part? Like what, what, what things are interesting customers right now? What are they saying I need to know about? It's absolutely cloud. And I think mm. that, you know, there's a lot of education that we're doing with customers. Uh, and depending on who you're talking to, it, you know, you could be talking to a customer that says that, you know, we're really not doing anything in the cloud. We're talking to the wrong people, that they're absolutely doing something in the cloud. And I think that's kind of the challenge is kind of finding the right people to help and, and to educate and to kind of show uh, the technology that Checkpoint has. That That is kind of interesting, isn't it? Because you're right. If if a customer says to us, we're not doing anything in the cloud, it's like, yeah, you, you are, obviously. Otherwise, you wouldn't. After 18 months of lockdown and pandemic, you wouldn't be alive if you weren't doing something yeah. in the cloud, right? So so us us security people need to go find that, that other team. But what's interesting is, if we're not, that other team, that cloud team, they're out doing stuff. Are they not reaching out to security? Is security an afterthought for these cloud teams, um, you know, end users? Uh, that, that, that's just kind of interesting to me to, that we're not kind of calibrating that conversation effectively, or I shouldn't say effectively, but do you know what I mean? Right? Is it an yeah. afterthought to most of those people? Yeah, I, I think it, it, it's like uh, security was a decade ago. It's like the perception is that we're a, uh, an obstacle, not an enabler, right? Security controls kind of get in the way. They slow down the business. It's the same with the cloud right now. I think that the, the DevOps people, they want to kind of run it as they should be able to, right? Do things as fast as you can and, and automate as fast as you can. Uh, and I guess the beauty now is that we can provide those security controls and it's not getting in the way, right? It doesn't slow things down. It does actually enable them uh, to keep that speed and flexibility and you know, have the security as well. Right. Now I'm going to bring a comment up by Mohit and, and both Doug and I are tough gentlemen, so we can take this one right on the chin, Mohit. And thank you very much for putting it out there. It's bold of you, my friend. So Mohit says, nowadays, Palo Alto grooming the market. What is the reason behind? I think what you mean is um, the reason behind, um, actually compound on that, Mohit. I'd like to hear more from you, man. I think what you mean is the reason behind the, the, um, the perhaps distortion between talking to cloud people and talking to, to the networking people is a, uh, you know, a grooming of the marketing conversation. I think that's what you mean by that. But you know what? It actually brings up an interesting uh, conversation for us, Mohit, because I joined Checkpoint in 2008. Palo Alto was formed in 2005. So we still hadn't heard their name. It takes a few years to kind of get up and running, right? And so, you know, but being kind of a new kid on the block, everybody's interested, right, in the new kid on the block. And I remember at the time being approached by Palo Alto. I'd just joined Checkpoint. I was about a year in. And so, you know, you don't want to move when you're a year in because obviously I'm a year in, right? I'm establishing myself here. The thing that I really appreciated about Checkpoint is, number one, that I'll put it bluntly, the Palo Alto group was birthed out of Checkpoint. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's, that's one thing. So I kind of thought, oh, I'll, stick, I'll stick with the founding father of cybersecurity, Gil Swed, the guy that started this company. Um, you know, but, but also, you know, the fact that 
we we we're not going anywhere anytime soon right and i remember by about 2010 2012 you know a lot of talk about marketing so i did this and i think this is your point mohit and you're saying yes okay thanks man that's really cool i think this is also your point and you probably haven't done this research so let me give you a little hint here mohit this was great now this was back in probably around 2012 13. somebody said to me because I've been with Checkpoint on and off since then. I did a little startup in Silicon Valley and then came back, which should tell you how much I love this company. And so when I came back, I was chatting with some folks who were saying, you know, it's all, you know, we hear a lot of the noise, like you're saying, Mohit, about Palo Alto grooming the market. You're dead right there, man. So I thought, gee, you know, why is that? Why, why is it that an established company like Checkpoint, after a couple of decades, isn't owning the conversation as much in the marketplace? So then I went to look at what's called our 1099s. Now, 1099s, because Mohit, I think you might be, um, you could be international, I'm not sure. Um, but 1099s are the SEC, so the Securities and Exchange Commission, filing for publicly traded companies. So when you're a publicly traded company like Checkpoint is, all of our financial information is released to the public so that people can make investment choices about us. Same with Palo Alto when they IPO, same with all these other companies. All right, so I thought, well, in there, will be the secret to how much money they spend on marketing versus engineering. Interesting. So I went to look again around 2013 ish, somewhere around that year. At that time, I remember the numbers, obviously it'd be different today, but the ratio will be the same. At that time, Checkpoint was spending about 400 and something million dollars on sales and marketing. The bulk of it, of course, being employee salaries, right? Employees are, are always your biggest expense at any company. So 400 and something million sales and marketing. Okay. Palo Alto's 1.5 billion. Now think about that, right? You want what we call share of voice. So I've been moved into a marketing role over the years at Checkpoint. So I'm in marketing, Doug's in engineering still and engineering leadership in this case as a director of our company. So in marketing, dollars makes a difference, right? Because you want to advertise. Advertising is super expensive. I mean, everybody still talks about the 1984 Apple computers ad. That was the most expensive ad for any tech company in history at the time, right? A Super Bowl ad. And so, okay, we're being outspent three to one. So then I thought, okay, let's look at how much R&D money gets invested. And you as a customer, Mohit, um, you know, and uh, Diraj, if you're still listening, my friend, and anyone to the archive, that's the number you really want to pay attention to, of course. Now, I don't actually remember the statistics, but I do remember because it was a flip of the ratio. We were outspending PAN by three times on R&D. And I thought, yeah, all right, this is cool. <laughs> I'll stick with that. You know, there's a downside to that, which is that, as you pointed out, Mohit, right? You know, people are being groomed by our um, you know, competitors. People are being groomed by startups. You could have a startup today that has wickedly, you know, a creative marketing and puts a lot of energy and, and money into marketing, right? Uh, in order to position themselves for a sale. And, um, you know, these, these are the interesting things. And I tell you, Doug, I actually feel, I feel for customers because when you first started out, there were probably what? Less than 50 cybersecurity companies in the world? Probably less than that even, right? If you yeah. really go back. Right. So now what customers have to do, and this is why you're running a team of people to help customers with this, you have over like close to a thousand mature cybersecurity companies. There are well more than a thousand. I'm talking about mature ones, big ones like us and Cisco and all that lot. Um, all with thousands of web pages to read. Well, this gave birth to, you know, Forrester and Gartner and Magic Quadrants because they try to help people decipher all that. This is what your teams do, right? And that's why I asked the question a little earlier, like what are they seeing in the wild? Which I'd love to get, let's get back to that. Um, what, what else are people seeing in the wild? So you're in the Chicago, you're in the Illinois area, uh, just for point of reference. You know, what's keeping people awake at night? What are your teams talking about? What are they mostly stressed about? I think that, you know, the most recent attacks, you know, that have been in the news, I think are a pretty big deal. The thing that's tough is, you know, a lot of times we'll talk to customers or partners and they think they're immune to it, right? It's like, well, this, this can't happen to us. And it's really hard to kind of take off the sales hat and just want to help. 
It's like, mm -hmm. a, you know, we don't, yes, we, we do want to try and sell something ultimately, but more important than that, we want to help you see that there's a problem or there's a danger, or there's a risk, and, and we want to help prevent that. And it's, it's really hard sometimes trying to get that message across that because uh, there are so many vendors, you know, knocking at the door. It's like we, we truly want to help, right? We want to make the world a better, safer place and uh, just be the best at, at cybersecurity. And I think that that's probably one of the biggest challenges. That and I guess the education. Huh. Just you know, having people be aware uh, of, you know, kind of the, the black hat, white hat. What, what are the bad things that are out there? Uh, you know, how, how they're getting smarter and, uh, you know, more savvy, but then also understand the technology that the checkpoints developing uh, that can stay ahead of that. I'm actually really interested to hear you say that because, you know, I, I like you, you know, I talk to CISOs and, and cyber guys all the time. And I hear a lot that, Eddie, can you help me talk to my CEO? You know, but I'm not talking to the CEOs, that doesn't happen, but help arm me with the vocabulary I need to get the budget that I want to, because most CEOs, like you said a few moments ago, it's just like, I don't think that's gonna happen. Although I tell you, ransomware has really hit a whole new level. So people are sitting up to attention. The White House has come out with that, you know, ransomware task force. After Colonial, they sent out a, a memo, right? The White House sent out a memo to kind of, you know, all of corporate America. It was a fairly bad document as far as what you should do, patch your service. But that's kind of not the point. The White House isn't a cybersecurity company. But what they did do is they bought, you know, they brought it to people's attention, right? And yeah. so now I think CEOs are starting to go, hmm, really, are we secure? But for the most part, you know, up until recently, people haven't said that. So to hear you say it about actual cybersecurity leaders, you know, that's, that's a rough one, but we live and breathe this all the time. Now, we've got a, a comment coming in from, I hope I'm pronouncing this okay, uh, Raki. So, Raki, thank you very much for uh, for joining us. And, yes, this is kind of a uh, Ask Me Anything uh, open mic session with uh, one of the, uh, the the checkpoint heroes that makes things happen. And Raki's saying, hi, uh, why there is uh, increased uh, cyber attacks. I think it was what you were going to write there. So, yeah, exactly. And I was going to make a comment, and this is a perfect segue into that. So I think the short answer there is because there's a lot of money in it, right? There's a lot of money in, you know, taking things from, from companies and they're kind of doing bad things. That, that That's criminal. From a sea level, I think it's it's really easy to kind of look at a proposal and see what the cost of saying yes is. I, I think that with all the attacks mm. that are going on right now, it, it helps us be able to show them, well, here's the cost of saying no. And guess what? The cost of saying no sometimes is, you know, orders of magnitude higher than the cost of saying yes. So, yeah, it's money that may not have been in a budget, but so is ending up in the headlines, right, being breached. Well, and Raki's chiming in too, and, and thank you, Raki, again, by saying, you know, for the past year, life has changed a lot for us to, on, the, on the security side of things. And look, for those listening right now, this is a show uh, 12 o'clock every Monday Eastern time. So I'm out of New York, Doug's out of um, Illinois. I'll have people from Europe in a few weeks. I'll have people from our Asia Pac community. This is a behind the scenes look at the uh, people that make the magic happen at Checkpoint. So thank you very much for joining us. And Raki say, jumping in again saying, but money is there for, um, money is there for long in, in markets. Uh, actually jump in again there, uh, Raki, and just explain that one. I didn't quite understand it. Um, I think perhaps you might mean in the long term. And I certainly hope so, uh, right, in the cybersecurity market. It, it's a tough one, though, for, C, for CFOs and CEOs because um, – so, Raki, just to finish the – oh, no, sorry, this is Klaus. Klaus, you sound like you're coming across from Europe. Thank you very much for joining us, Klaus. Again, every 12 o'clock Monday Eastern time, we'll be doing this show. Uh, there is a solution to stop the attacks. And uh, Raki saying welcome. Yeah, thank you again for, uh, for joining us. Um, and Klaus, jump in and, and tell us, you know, a little bit more about what you think uh, these solutions are and kind of round out your thought there. We'd love to hear from you. I was saying it's tough for CISOs, though, right? Because, you know, the, the, the challenge or, or CFOs, the challenge is if you think about industry, right, CEOs and CFOs, how do they get into their role? Well, they typically take a business degree, a finance degree, an MBA. They become chartered accountants if they go in the CFO route, MBOs for the CEO route. 
Where's the technology in that? There isn't. So then they get to the top and they fight their way through the ranks 20 years later, they're the CEO or they're the CFO. And then usually someone who's half their age, who's a CISO, <laughs> right, comes yeah. to them and says, blah, 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 technical, 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 I need $20 million. Difficult conversation, you know, and that's partly why I want this 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 uh, live stream every Monday to be something that CFOs and CEOs can actually hear and listen to. Now, Klaus is jumping in with uh, Bit uh, Bitdentify technology. Doug, do you know what Bitdentify is? I don't. I, I apologize, I do not. Okay, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, we'll uh, here. I'm going to look that up at the same time as uh, as us chatting. What um. Any, any thoughts about how we might find a solution to the problem of communicating the complex thing of cybersecurity to people that don't have a technical background, like the CFOs and, and, and CEOs? I, I think that the best way is to show them, right? I mean, it, it's not a PowerPoint slide. It, it's often not an elevator pitch conversation. It's you know, showing them a report or a dashboard uh, that shows their environment and, and what's good, what's bad, how safe are you, where are you exposed, and, and what are the potential risks. And I think providing them that visibility gives them good data points to be able to make a decision. We, they need to see it. They need to kick the tires. Good stuff. And I looked up Bit Identify. I'm not sure if it's if if that was a plug, Klaus. I don't really mind, but I we're trying not to be salesy on this uh, on this uh, stream. Uh, it could be. It looks like an, an interesting tool. So I'll, I'll just leave that one there rather than plug it, my friend. But I really appreciate your uh, your jumping in and continue to do so. Now, Doug, here's a blast from the past. Are you ready for this name coming up? There's sure. a blast from the past for you, buddy. Oh. <laughs> That's the reaction every checkpointer would have, right? So Kelman Meghew, an old hero of checkpoints. So Kelman's saying, should customers be investing in cyber insurance along with uh, security technologies, or uh, can one take budget from the other? You know what's interesting? I wrote a little blog post on the CNA um, hack. So see, I see I said it, hack. Um, penetration, right? Not hack. I mean, I really need to move that vocabulary of mine because it's, hacking is not the same as threat actors, right? So CNA Insurance, one of the world's largest cyber insurance companies, was um, uh, maliciously penetrated about um, four or five months ago. And they actually did a terrible job disclosing it. I, th I think they did what I call the Microsoft Doctrine, or I've actually taken that from James Azer, a buddy of mine, the Microsoft Doctrine, where Microsoft, when they are um, breached, very much open up the kimono. They're like, hey, guys, we're really, this is really bad, all the way down to the source code. They're really good communicators with it. CNA had their PR firm cover up a lot of stuff. They paid about 40 million in ransom and they would kind of put up on their front page, we'll let you know if there's a problem. And it's like, really? Mm. But I postulated, I wonder if the threat actors were looking for the insurance premium payout amounts for ransomware attacks. So, so then you see things like Colonial Pipelines for five mil. That was a big one, right? What was the one last weekend? Set, 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 Centrify, Cent, Centrify, I forget the name of the company. That was like 70 million, right? And so if I was a threat actor, I would want to know if I'm shortchanging myself by asking for a million dollars when the insurance policy is going to pay out five, right? Yeah. So that's what I think might have happened there. And that's, you know, I mean, hey, tackle Kelman's question by all means, my friend, but that's kind of a, not a direct answer to, to Kelman's question. But yeah, yeah, what do you think? What do you think what, what uh, Kelman's asking there? Well, one, I think Kelman's a very smart guy and he probably n knows the answer to that. I think one obviously could take, you know, budget from the other. Uh, what's right or wrong, I mean, it's probably going to depend on the company, right? What, what their culture is, what their risk tolerance is. Uh, so I, I don't know that there's necessarily a right or a wrong answer there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and certainly, I mean, you know, the, I think what's going to happen is, you know, SEC is going to get involved, big governments. I'm going to get, I'm a libertarian, right? So I roll my eyes when I say that. But government's going to start forcing people to get insurance, there's going to be lobby groups get involved. So it's, it, it's it'll become big. It already is big. I mean, the side. Yeah, I'd rather big. prevent it than deal with the insurance, right? Yeah, so I yeah. The right answer is just make it so it doesn't happen. If you decide to still do insurance because you want to or have to, then so be it, right? It's it's a multi multi billion dollar industry. So as soon as that happens, when there's money involved, 
you know, big organizations get involved. This LinkedIn user, and I'm sorry, I normally stream on my phone to see who the LinkedIn user is because sometimes people's settings doesn't show who they are. I don't know your name, my friend. Um, mm -hmm. It's a tough one going back to what we we're talking about with the, uh, the CR, CISO CFO relationship, uh, especially given optimization and automation demands. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Diraj is jumping back in again. Thanks, Diraj. The attacks are automated and response is still manual. Hmm. Doug, I want you to respond to that in a second. Unless there is automation in responding to the attacks, the attackers will keep having the unfair advantage. What do you think, Doug? That's a, it's a great question. I'm going to pose it as a question. Is that is that the case? I don't believe that that is the case. I think that that's one of the things that, that differentiates Checkpoint is the ability to be able to automate that prevention, right? To know the, the zero day attacks, you know, be able to prevent things that have never been seen before. And, and again, I think that's one of the things that, you know, seeing in a proof of concept or seeing in a demo or in a live environment to, to be able to have it automated, you don't have to push a button, right? You configure the solution. And I mean, we're, we're using it internally, right? We, we eat our own dog food. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think the checkpoint uh, has been exposed like that. So yeah. it definitely is automated, not manual. It needs to be. Um, I, I think I understand what you mean, Diraj, with, you know, there there is a certain amount of putting human eyes on screen, um, but it needs to be because here's the problem that, that you, Diraj, and the rest of the cybersecurity community faces, and we, we really understand this to the core of our um, heart at Checkpoint, threat actors only need to be right once. Right? They can be wrong 99% of the time, and there's no penalty for being wrong. Okay, so there's no additional infrastructure they need to buy to be wrong. There's nothing else that happens. There's no penalty for being wrong as a threat actor. Okay, they only need to be right once and they have success. Whereas a CISO, a cybersecurity team, need to be right 100% of the time. And there is massive penalty for being wrong once, 1% 1 of the time. So we have to automate this stuff because, um, you know, otherwise, uh, Dares, you're going to be awake 24-7. You've got to drink lots of coffee, my friend. Um, Klaus is saying um, all your important data will be uh, transparent, uh, talking about that other system. We're going back here to uh, bit identity is new thinking, so maybe not a product. I'll have to look into it, man. Thank you very much for, uh, for bringing that to us. And We'll be again streaming next week at the same time, which is 12 noon Eastern. And uh, once I do a little bit of homework on it, yeah, if it's a new thinking, new philosophy, I'd be all over uh, hearing that. Um, Renke is saying uh, both are needed. And uh, I think you're referring to uh, probably manual and automated. Yeah, we do need human eyes, whereas the threat actors can automate everything, right? And then just go have their beer and come back when they've got, uh, when they've got entry somewhere. Um, let's see here, just going through some, ah, oh, Ranky's jumping in on the insurance dialogue, uh, to, uh, insurance assures damage will cover and security budgets are given necessarily needed. Uh, I think what you're saying there, Ranky, is that, um, the insurance, uh, yeah, in other words, good, get insurance because it'll cover the damage. It's interesting though, because you know what's going to happen when big money is involved, you're going to get lobby groups, especially here in the US, right? Um, uh, and these lobby groups are going to start putting pressure on insurance companies to say, hey, you know, if you've got my product, you can lower your insurance premiums and then we'll do some kind of, you know, back pocket deal there, right? So anyway, things will change and we'll just have to move with them as they do. Klaus is saying the cyber attacks uh, are like small kids in 24 months, it will be, it will be be large. Okay. All right. I'm not sure what that means. All right. Sounds good. And you are welcome, my friend. All right. That's awesome. We've got about five minutes left in our show here today, Doug. So, you know, this is cool, man. Um, let's end on a, uh, on a fun note. I saw when we were fiddling about in the preamble, a keyboard uh, next to you. How long have you been playing the piano? So not uh, my wife uh, got me a lesson. I I'd always played around the piano growing up. Could never really play so probably five years ago, started playing and realized I still can't read music, but I can follow YouTube. And it's amazing the, the different, you know, blues riffs and, and classical pieces that you can learn just, you know, watching a YouTube video or kind of downloading software. So, no, it's uh, hmm. super, super stress relieving and uh, something I really enjoy. So music's awesome, right? Music is universal uh goodness to me so 
Dude, I, I, wow, well, I can hear it. I can hear that's all heart. You've fallen in love with that, haven't you? Clearly, yeah. Yeah. music is the best. Yeah, music is yeah. everything. It's therapy for the soul, man. That's awesome. Um, and the fact that you picked it up only five years ago, so that goes to show we grown ups can learn new. You can teach an old dog new tricks, Doug. Absolutely. 100%. 100%. <laughs> <laughs> All right, beautiful. Ladies and gentlemen, 12 noon Eastern, every single Monday, we're going to do a show which is a behind the scenes look at the people that make the magic happen at Checkpoint Software. So I hope you enjoyed this. Tune in next week. Thank you so much for giving us your input, your questions, your thoughts, and anything goes. This is an Ask Me Anything. Doug, I want to thank you, man. So uh, stick right there because we'll end the broadcast and we'll chat just afterwards. As for everybody else, ladies and gentlemen, be safe online. Fantastic. All right. Thanks, take care. Thanks.